Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of our Wellness Wednesday videos. I'm Dr. Marie Holowaychuk and the topic uh, for today is the impact of the pandemic on veterinary teams. So before I go ahead and get started, just a brief introduction for those of you who don't know me or haven't been to one of these Wellness Wednesdays before. I'm a small animal emergency and critical care specialist and of course a passionate advocate for the mental health and well-being of veterinary team members. Um, in fostering that passion, I work as a locum, uh, mostly doing teleconsulting for emergency and critical care. I'm also a consultant, a blogger, and a researcher when it comes to well-being. And with that in mind, I do offer intensive programs online for individuals with regards to boundaries and burnout prevention and workplace well-being. And I'll chat about one of my programs later on in today's session. Um, I also do consulting and smaller programs for individual hospitals and keynotes and online workshops for conferences, hoping, of course, to be someday soon back speaking in person. And I recently started converting my videos into audio format for my Reviving Vet Med podcast. So if you are a podcast listener and you find it cumbersome to remember to, you know, get the videos or, or be here live and you just want to have the podcast, the audio version of this come into your podcast feed, you can subscribe to my Reviving Vet Med podcast on all of the regular podcast platforms. And when I'm not doing all the things well-being and critical care related, um, especially as the weather is getting warmer, I love to hike, I strength train regularly, and pretty much all the rest of the time I'm chasing after my toddler who is about 21 months old. All right. So a few logistics before we get into the content today. Um, many of you are tuning in through Zoom. Welcome. I am broadcasting this through Zoom, so I am able to see comments that come up in the Zoom chat. So if you have comments or questions that you would like to ask and you are tuning in through Zoom, please do submit those questions there. Um, for those of you who are tuning in through Facebook, hello and welcome as well. I unfortunately cannot see your questions through Zoom via Facebook, but I will hop onto Facebook when this video is done and I will answer your questions then. Okay, so what prompted this session? Well, one of the obvious factors is that we are officially now two years into the pandemic. So it was just announced uh, two years ago this week by the World Health Organization uh, that the world was undergoing or experiencing a pandemic uh, due to coronavirus-19. And um, I have this picture up here because just a couple of weekends ago, I took my daughter out to a restaurant for the very first time. So in her whole entire life. And for me, it was my first time being out to a restaurant in literally two years. So it's, it's been a sloth. It's, it's been a big haul for many of us. And especially for those of us in the veterinary profession, it continues to be a slog. And so that's really what prompted me to want to take a step back and just really look at what has the pandemic changed and how has the pandemic influenced the veterinary profession as a whole. And so the outline for today's session is to review some of the research that has come out um, a lot of it in the last few months, really highlighting the impact of the pandemic on the veterinary industry. And this is going to be information in the context of our clients, of the veterinary student perspective, and of course, on veterinary teams. I also want to bring particular attention to one of those studies which looked at the increase in ethically challenging situations that have been experienced by veterinary team members and how um, individuals are coping with that. And then the bulk of this session is going to be on the findings from the 2021 Merck Animal Health Wellbeing Study. This is the third survey study that has been done by Merck Animal Health in conjunction with the um, American Veterinary Medical Association. It's a very well-designed, rigorous study, giving us a really um, randomized population of, of feedback from veterinarians and this year veterinary team members with regards to their well being. So, this is the first study that we have to compare to pre pandemic numbers. So, those are some pretty interesting findings as well. 
So when we look at the pandemic, what has happened? What has changed? What have we now been exposed to? Well, of course, these are just a few of the many, many things that we've experienced that have come up for us during the last two years, one being curbside service. So having to figure out how do we still deliver veterinary medicine, which is an essential service, but while maintaining physical distancing from our clients. A lot of practices chose to use vet video consults. And so we've learned to adapt and to utilize technology to our advantage. And in the same vein, telemedicine has really taken off. We've had a higher caseload in the last two years. And unfortunately, we have not been able to accommodate that, that higher caseload in many circumstances. And so a pop-off valve has sort of been this idea of teletriage or telemedicine in order to serve some of the clients that cannot get into the veterinary practices. Unfortunately, some practices have had to close, um, some permanently and many temporarily because they just did not have the staff, whether that was because people were off sick or people had to be home with their families. This was a huge issue um, and even an issue for some hospitals whereby they have the staff, but not enough to meet the demand. And so they closed their doors to new cases, but they were still serving the cases that they had. Again, that short staffing due to illness or losing staff due to family responsibilities has been a huge pressure on the system. And we've all had an increase in caseload because of this increase in pet adoption. The so-called pandemic puppies and COVID kitty cats um, have been wreaking havoc on our small animal hospital systems. So I'm going to highlight the findings from some of these studies that I mentioned. And this first study was looking at the first few months of COVID-19 and the dog owners veterinary related concerns. So this was a survey study for more than 4,100 4, pet owners in the United States and Canada. And they found that their concerns were related to the availability of a veterinarian for emergency and non-emergency care. Remember, this was really early on in the pandemic when we weren't sure, like, were veterinary clinics going to close? Were we considered an essential service? And that definitely trickled down to fears amongst pet owners. There was also fears regarding the ability to afford veterinary care and dog supplies, and then concerns about what would happen if I became sick and I wasn't able to care for my dog. These were all dog owners. And so plans for a secondary caregiver, interestingly, within the survey, while the fear was very high, very few people actually had plans in place. And interestingly as well, the fears were most pronounced in dog owners under 30 years of age, whether that's a reflection of these being relatively new dog owners, maybe not having well-established relationships with a veterinarian, um, not quite sure, but that was one of the study findings. Now, another interesting finding um, also to come out was looking at the veterinary student perspective of COVID-19 on veterinary medicine. So this was a very small, uh, just investigative study, really looking at the thoughts of 24 second year veterinary students at Cornell University. And they really just kind of collectively came together and shared what they felt was going to be the impact of the pandemic on veterinary medicine. And the four main themes that emerged were the emotional and social impacts. So issues with regards to this building human animal bond, people spending more time at home, potential supply chain issues, you know, um, even, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, remember where we were giving up a lot of our PPE and, and other supplies, even for me as a criticalist, a lot of the hospitals were giving up their ventilators to make sure that the human hospitals had sufficient amounts. And then the financial stressors, you know, are we are still a fee for service industry and if our clients have lost their jobs, or are unable to work because of COVID that impacts us as well. And then adapting to challenges was a big theme um, in terms of contactless appointments, uh, collaborations to advance the pandemic response. So again, these One Health initiatives coming together, um, you know, volunteering our services, volunteering our supplies and equipment um, to, to help human medicine, not just veterinary medicine. And then diverse perspectives necessary for tackling pandemic-related disparities. So really highlighting this importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we have a 
very diverse population and there are disparities, whether we like it or not, when it comes to um, people's ability to seek care um, in response to COVID. And we, in order for us to fix that, we need diverse perspectives to look into the problem solving for that. So that was a, these are some great themes highlighted from the students at Cornell. Now, this was a study that looked at um, the use of video-based telemedicine. So having synchronous telemedicine appointments, whereby um, these were survey responses collected from 550 veterinarians, mostly in North America, mostly in small animal practice, um, who were accessing the survey through VIN. And they basically looked at individuals um, and whether or not they were utilizing video technology to have a consult simultaneously with an owner in another location. And so the use of video-based telemedicine had increased substantially um, during the pandemic, of course. Very few practices were doing this before COVID. 66% reported little to no difficulty adopting video conferencing. 45% felt that te telemedicine took less time, and 76% felt that it resulted in less financial compensation than an in-person consultation. So that's an interesting finding. And, um, you know, there was a lot of concerns about the inferiorities of not having a client present in the exam room, you know, to show them something on your physical exam or to really demonstrate something or even just to establish that rapport in order to get them on board for advanced testing, um, or advanced diagnostics. And then there was also concerns regarding legal issues, like what is this as effective and what if things get lost in translation? Many of the people who responded to the survey plan to discontinue this video-based telemedicine once the pandemic was over and in-person um, uh, appointments were allowed again. So interesting perspective there. Um, there was also communication challenges highlighted in a recent Australian Vet Journal article. And so um, this is where it gets really interesting for me from a well-being perspective. These were survey responses from 540 veterinarians and vet nurses techs, so 78% vets, 22% vet nurses or vet techs mostly in companion animal practice, again, 68% in companion, companion animal practice in Australia. And the communication challenges were many. They highlighted not having face-to-face -face contact with clients and just dis difficulties communicating with clients in general, just not having that ability to demonstrate findings to clients, having difficulties explaining a plan. I mean, I, I think of, you know, as a surgeon or even for me as an emergency and critical care doctor, if I have a back dog and and I want to, you know, demonstrate or um, give a picture of the spinal cord compression and what that means for signs. It can be very difficult to do that when you're just having a, a voice conversation with someone rather than a whiteboard in front of you um, on which to draw on. And um, difficulty understanding others because of PPE, you know, depending on the mask and how it fits you, it can really muffle your voice. And then, of course, you can't see people's lips move. You can't, um, you know, suss out what they may be um, enunciating or pronouncing. And especially when we get into medical jargon and, and telling people these words that they've never heard before, it can be incredibly confusing. And just general miscommunication, not just with clients, but among team members as as well. And then another big communication challenge was communicating biosecurity protocols or restrictions and the impact, of course, that that has on the team. So many issues there. Now, I want to bring particular attention to the, the stressful events that we call ethically challenging situations. And so this was actually the same survey study that I just mentioned that was done in Australia, looking mostly at veterinarians, but also vet techs and nurses as well. And they took information out of their survey study, specifically looking at these situations that really challenge us from a moral ethical perspective. And this has always been a challenge for us in vet medicine. You know, we have clients that ask for euthanasia when we maybe feel that it's not necessarily indicated, or we know that a client really would be better served by going to a referral hospital for some intensive care, but the client can't afford it. So we do the best we can in general practice. These are 
challenging situations. And what this survey demonstrated is that where these situations used to happen several times per month before the pandemic, during the pandemic, veterinarians and vet techs and nurses said that these situations were happening several times per week. So that is a huge increase. And there was five situations that the survey respondents described as very or maximally challenging. And those included conflicts between the interests of clients and their animals. So what the veterinarian felt was in the best interest of the animal conflicted with what the client was felt it was in the best interest. And that's something that we've dealt with before um, the pandemic. The second was that conflicts arose between the interests of the employer and the employee. And yeah, sometimes this happens. I can think of situations where, for example, I made a mistake in the hospital and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna let this owner know their pet is fine nothing happened because of it, but it's my ethical, you know, I, I feel ethically uh, bound to let them know and having a administrator say to me, no, you know what, we'd rather you not let the owner know that if everything was fine. So that is an example of a conflict pre-pandemic, but you can imagine now within the pandemic, We've got the employer wanting us to keep our doors open, continue to see cases. The clients want to be in the hospital, so the employer might want them to be in the hospital, and we as employees might not feel comfortable with that. The third very or maximally challenging situation was, was with regards to how to proceed when clients have limited finances. And is this happening more during the pandemic in the face of people not being able to work, people losing their jobs? Thankfully, it seems like we are on an economic recovery at this point. But remember, you know, 18 months ago when we were deep into the pandemic, um, how high those unemployment rates had risen to. And then number four, conflict between personal well-being and professional role. So feeling this duty to do the work that we do as veterinary providers, but also um, that puts us at risk. When we are dealing with clients and people who potentially have COVID-19, we are putting ourselves at risk. And then number five, similarly, is the conflict between the well-being of the family and household members and a person's professional role. So once again, we've never faced this before, where many of us live with or care for immunocompromised individuals, older individuals, individuals who cannot get vaccinated. And now we are torn because we need to care for them and keep them safe, but we also have this professional obligation to our clients and to our team. And so again, it's no surprise when you look at these um, situations that they would certainly be impacting us more and therefore decreasing our well-being, having to deal with these situations on a regular basis. So if you're interested in learning more about these particular situations, more examples, and what the authors of this paper recommended to help in terms of employers and employees in this situation, I wrote a blog this month specifically highlighting these findings, and it's called Ethically Challenging Situations Have Risen Dramatically in Vet Medicine During the Pandemic. So if you go to my website, mariehollowaychuck.com forward slash blog, you will find that post, and I will also link to the post in the show notes for this uh, session as well. So for the rest of this session today, our episode, I do want to focus on the Merck Animal Health Veterinary Wellbeing Study findings. So this is the third study done in collaboration with the American Vet Med Association, specifically looking at U.S. veterinarians and their well-being. So the beautiful thing about this study is it is a randomized survey study. Compared to many of the other studies that I've talked about that are survey studies, there's a bias because the survey is just kind of put out there into the world world and people will choose to respond or not respond and very often there's bias when they do respond that they feel very strongly about the topic which is why they choose to participate. In this study the the researchers will go into the AVMA database and they randomly sample 30,000 veterinarians and staff this year and they send the survey out to those staff and then they obtain a, a sample from those veterinarians and staff members. And so ultimately this year's 
uh, survey ended up collecting results from about 2,500 US vets and almost 450 veterinary staff. And this survey responses were collected between September and October 2021. So we are well into the pandemic at this point. And the beauty of that is that we could then compare these survey findings to surveys collected back in 2019, which was the last time that this survey was done. Now, what they found as critically or moderately important concerns among the veterinary population in this survey was that stress levels of vets and staff are the highest concern. People in the industry right now recognize that we are under a tremendous amount of stress. And in fact, 92% feel like this is the highest concern. And believe it or not, this is unchanged pre-pandemic to pandemic um, times. So this, this value remains the highest at 92%. Um, what's interesting is that the shortage of qualified veterinary support staff has now skyrocketed to the next highest concern at 91% of people having that concern. And the shortage of veterinarians increased the most of all concerns. Back in 2019, only 50% of those surveyed felt that this was a critical or moderately important concern. And in 2021, 82% feel that a shortage of veterinarians is a critical or moderately important concern. So um, clearly we've had a, a increase in demand for veterinarians and also a shortage of supply. So the well-being of the veterinarians and veterinary team members was also assessed in this study. And the way that the Merck study looks at well-being is to categorize it and score it. It's scored and then categorized into flourishing, which is the best, getting by, which is sort of the meh, you know, how are you doing? Meh, I'm, I'm getting by, you know, what you hear people say, and then suffering, which is that a person is not doing well. And typically well-being is judged as how you view your life in comparison to your ideal life. Okay. And Overall, believe it or not, pre-pandemic to pandemic, the well-being of veterinarians was pretty much unchanged. There was a slight increase in veterinarians who are suffering, which went up from 9% in 2019 to 12% in 2021, but overall things are relatively unchanged. Now, bear in mind there is a huge disparity by age and practice setting. So younger veterinarians have much lower well-being scores and companion animal and mixed animal veterinarians also have lower well-being scores compared to food animal and equine veterinarians. So we're seeing still a big disparity there depending on where you are in your career and what your practice setting is. So keeping that in mind. What was really interesting too is this is the first time we've been able to look at the well-being of veterinary staff and it is very different compared to veterinarians. 26% are flourishing, which is about half of the 57% of veterinarians who are flourishing. Much, much more are just getting by. So 70% of our vet techs and vet nurses are getting by compared to 31% of veterinarians, um, but fewer are suffering. So 4% are suffering compared to that 12% of veterinarians who are suffering. But again, big difference in well-being depending on who you're looking at in your practice. Now, the survey also measures serious psychological distress, and this, unfortunately, has increased since pre-pandemic times across all age groups, but most notably among middle-aged veterinarians. Now, I don't have a reason for why this is. I can only imagine as a middle-aged person myself with a young child, there is a big burden on middle-aged individuals with family in the pandemic having to juggle like, oh my gosh, now my kids are out of school and now the daycare is closed and this, that, and the other. And so I wonder if that has increased the distress, but again, we don't know the why, we, know, we just know the what that this study demonstrates. And what's also um, distressing is that the serious psychological distress levels are almost twice as high among veterinary support staff compared to veterinarians. So vet techs and support staff have distress among 18% of their population compared to 10% of veterinarians. So again, big differences depending on who we're looking at in the hospital. 
Now, when they looked at the causes of COVID-related types of stress, so this is where they tried to suss out a little bit of overall why we're seeing this increase. A lot of it was concerns about short staffing due to illness or family needs, concerns about increased exposure to COVID-19 at work, and then just the fact that the days were longer, you know, especially in those cumbersome times when we're transitioning to curbside and telemedicine and we haven't gotten the flow right and we're having to call the owner six times by phone just to kind of get through one appointment, um, that would have been for, made for much longer, more trying days. Now, the Merck Animal Health Veterinary Wellbeing Study also looks at burnout. And interestingly, once again, there was no overall statistical change compared to 2019 pre-pandemic. However, there was a higher prevalence of burnout among staff, once again, at 50% of veterinary staff having burnout compared to 31% of veterinarians. So again, our staff members are really struggling in some ways more than our veterinarians. Those who had higher burnout tended to have lower well-being scores and higher incidence of serious psychological distress. And they looked at some of the workplace factors that were contributing to this as well. And they found that working in a more chaotic environment tended to produce more burnt out individuals, having less control over work, also induced this, so perhaps more um, predominant in the emergency care setting, and working more hours per week, or working evenings, or working weekends. So there was definitely some particular work patterns or work situations that tended to create a predominance of burnout. And um, I think that's something that every one of us have experienced if you if you work in any of these particular conditions. Now, um, the good things that come out of this study, you know, the study also looks at um, what what predicts well-being and and what they find is consistent amongst the years well-being remains associated with non work related activities, the more people can carve out time to spend with family being physically active, whether it's getting out in nature or exercising engaging in a hobby socializing with friends was the top predictor that showed a massive difference between those with high well-being and those with not high well-being. And then getting enough sleep is another big one as well. One other interesting thing that the survey also looked at this year, because we have seen in previous years such a, a association between student debt and poor well-being, um, they found that veterinarians with a financial planner had lower levels of psychological distress. So again, perhaps that's a great reason to consider um, linking up with a financial planner, especially if you are trying to manage a, a high amount of student debt. So what the researchers came together and looked at as well is, you know, it's all fine and good to look as, look at these stats, but what can we do about it? And the fact of the matter is, is that employers and organizations ultimately have a big impact on the well-being of their teams. And so looking at some of the factors that are impacting team member well-being and burnout and distress, um, they suggested that employers and organizations make sure that they are offering some form of employee assistance program. If it's not offered within the professional veterinary medical association, you know, uh, membership, to offer it through the practice themselves or offer health insurance that includes mental health coverage and robust mental health coverage, um, which is not something that's included in a lot of health insurance plans to support taking time off from work for mental health treatments, whether it's to get to an appointment, whether it's to take a leave of absence, but to make that a part of um, what the veterinary practice supports and to work to provide a psychologically safe work environment that is built on a foundation of trust, open communication, enough time to get the work done, meaning sometimes we have to make adjustments. We have to lengthen our appointment times. Yes, it's going to mean seeing fewer clients, but again, this is to preserve the well-being of our teams and to engage in activities or to produce a culture which really fosters this sense of belonging to the team, which is something that a lot of people in the survey said was really important to them from a well-being perspective. 
So the key takeaways from what I've shared with you today are that the pandemic has had a deep and lasting impact on veterinary medicine and all of its stakeholders, everyone from the pet owners to the veterinary students to all the members of the team, we've all been impacted. And that we've especially been impacted in the context of these ethically challenging situations with an increased in frequency and changed in type during the pandemic. And that there are some adjustments that we need to make in order to help mitigate the effects of those ethically challenging situations. Uh, interestingly, based on the Merck Veterinary Wellbeing Study, well-being and burnout are relatively unchanged in the context of the pandemic, but serious psychological distress has actually increased, especially among middle-aged veterinarians. And looking at what can you do, if you're listening or watching, um, if you belong to an organization where you have the opportunity to make changes in your workplace, or if you are a team member and you have the opportunity to make some adjustments within your personal life, we want to do whatever we can to take steps to improve well-being and reduce burnout in the profession. Of course, that being our ultimate ultimate goal to be able to stay in this profession and thrive long term. So along those lines, a lot of you have been asking me about my program from Burnout to Balance, which is opening once again in April of this year. And so briefly, I just want to share with you, this program is an eight-week program that has been developed to mitigate burnout, to stop or recover people from burnout if they have, if they are experiencing burnout right now, or to prevent burnout for some individuals who know that they work in a situation that puts them at risk, which let's be honest, is pretty much everybody in this profession. And so the topics that we cover in this uh, eight week program are burnout, compassion, fatigue, moral stress, and the stressors in the workplace. We talk about the different dimensions of wellness and self-care. We talk about how to maintain healthy habits and sleep hygiene, how to develop healthy boundaries and have that work-life separation. We talk about the importance and the scientific rigor behind mindfulness and meditation. We talk about the detriments of perfectionism and how self-compassion can help. And we talk about mistakes and other difficult situations from work and how we can recover. So this situation is uh, structured in the form of an eight week time, which gives us lots of time to integrate what we learn into our everyday life. We start the week every week with a Monday motivator email. There are self-directed exercises, reflections and action steps that we can take forward from the program. Every week there is a webinar with breakout rooms and there's peer support in a private Facebook group as well. You also get one-on-one -on -one coaching from me and you come away with tangible tools and practical skills for managing or recovering from your burnout. In addition, there is 10 hours of continuing education credit in jurisdictions that recognize race. So again, those tangible takeaways, you're gonna have validated tools for recognizing compassion fatigue and burnout self-assessments to gauge your perfectionism, sleep hygiene, and self-compassion, reflection exercises for those stressors and your self-care, templates for creating a self-care plan and establishing healthy boundaries, practical strategies for maintaining healthy habits, tools for starting a mindfulness and meditation practice, and research strategies for coping with difficult work-related situations. So I can't stress enough how impactful and life-changing this program has been for the many individuals who have taken this program before. I've been delivering this program content for years now, and I hear from people months after the program, years even after the program is finished, that say that it has literally changed their life for the better. Now, I will address the top three hesitations when people are wondering if they should take the program. There is a big time commitment. You will need about two to three hours per week to fully engage in the program and get the most out of the content. A lot of people worry about the schedule. You know, well, I work on Wednesdays and what if I can't get to the webinar? All of the webinars are recorded for later watching and the Facebook group is open all the time so that you can engage with the content at any time. And that a lot of people say, gosh, you know, it's a big investment, Marie. I'm not sure if it's, you know, worth it for me to commit to that. And I can tell you that, yes, it's an investment, but it is an investment that is going to serve you for the rest of your life and for the rest of your career. 
So if you are interested in learning more or you think that you would like to register, please visit mariehollowaychick.com forward slash burnout. If you use the promo code balance 100, you will get $100 off program registration until midnight on Sunday. Program registration closes next Friday. So there isn't a lot of space left and there isn't a lot of time left either. Once the spots are filled, the registration is closed. And if you have questions, of course, about anything related to the program or burnout or well-being in general, you can email me at any time. So if the program is not for you and you just want to take away some tools for yourself or to share with your team on burnout, you can subscribe to my newsletter that comes out every other week. And upon subscribing, you will get a PDF of 10 tools to tackle burnout and achieve balance. Just go to mariehollowaychuck.com forward slash subscribe. And once again, if you would rather have these episodes delivered to your podcast platform every month, you can subscribe to my Reviving Vet Med podcast or go to my website, mariehollowaychuck.com forward slash podcast for other episodes. So I'm going to stick around here and just look for questions to come up in the chat. I'll be happy to answer those questions about any of the content that I shared with you today um, or any other questions that you might have about my programs or other offerings. If you would rather email me directly, you can always do that at info at mariehollowaychuck.com. Otherwise, I really hope to see you in my program or to see you on another live or to connect with you on any of the major social media platforms. So with that said, if there aren't any questions that come up, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Take care and we'll see you next time.